Hello students, today we are going to study about the second chapter in second PUC that is sexual reproduction in flowering plants. I will divide this chapter into two parts. In the part one, we will discuss about uh, the male reproductive part as well as the female reproductive part of the flowers and then we will discuss about uh, the fertilization events as well as post fertilization events that occurs in the flowering plant. So now let us move to the first line that is what is mean by flower. You know flowers are the very beautiful creature of the nature. Among the members of kingdom plantae, among the members of kingdom plantae Angiosperms are very beautiful, that is mainly because of the production of flowers. The flowers show great diversity in their color, great diversity in their morphology, but functionally the flowers are responsible for the sexual reproduction. Then what are flowers? Flowers are the modified shoot of the plant body. So shoot is nothing but the aerial parts of the plant body. So flower is a modified shoot responsible for sexual reproduction. So flower is considered as the fascinating organ of the angiosperm. So this is the fascinating organ of the angiosperm. And in case of human life, the flower plays a vital role. So in human life, the flowers are used as the objects of aesthetic, ornamental, social, religious and cultural value. And the flowers are used as symbols for conveying the important human feelings such as love, affection, happiness, etc. So in plant life, the flower is responsible for sexual reproduction and in human life, flowers are responsible for or flowers are used for conveying the various uh, feelings, the human feelings. Now, let us see the diagrammatic representation of uh, flower that is a longitudinal section of the flower. So this is uh, the diagram representing the L as of flower. L as means longitudinal section. Just to go through the important parts of this particular flower. The stalk of the flower is called as pedicel. The stalk of the flower is called as pedicel. And on the pedicel, all the floral parts are arranged. And the apex part, apex region of the pedicel is somewhat swollen or that may be expanded. The swollen apex of the pedicel on which the floral parts are arranged is called as thalamus. So thalamus is also called as receptacle. On the receptacle or on the thalamus all the floral parts are arranged. So we can classify the floral parts into two major types. One is called as essential floral oral. The another category of floral parts are called as non-essential floral parts. Just remember the floral parts are also called as floral leaves because the different floral parts are actually the modified leaves are actually the modified leaves that's why they are called as floral leaves and we can also call it as a floral orals so floral parts are nothing but the floral orals or the floral leaves then what is mean by the non-essential floral part and what are essential floral parts? Non-essential means the floral parts which are found in the flowers but not involved in the sexual reproduction directly. They are not directly involved in the process of reproduction but they are the part of the flower. Then why such floral parts are found in the flowers? The major function of such non-essential floral parts is providing protection to the internal organs and these non-essential floral parts includes calyx as well as corolla calyx is the outermost floral part and the calyx is made up of sepals so sepals are the units of calyx and you know in the bud condition all type of flowers they appear in almost same in color that is green in color that is mainly because of the sepals especially at the time of bud condition the internal organs are provided protection by this calyx so calyx is the outermost floral oral calyx is made up of sepals sepals are a small leafy like structure green in color normally they provides protection to the internal organs Again, based on the union of the cal uh, sepals, we can classify the calyx into 
gamosepalus as well as polysepalus. In polysepalus condition, the sepals are free and in gamosepalus calyx, sepals are fused. The next non-essential floral part that is the corolla. Corolla is a second floral oral and the corolla is composed of petals. Petals are larger in size, brightly colored and even scented. Why the petals are larger in size, why they are brightly colored? The reason is they are responsible for attracting the pollinating agents. The pollinators are attracted towards the flower mainly because of their color, mainly because of their fragrance and that fragrance, that color, that brightly appearance, the conspicuous nature of the flower is mainly because of corolla. And the corolla is made up of petals. So this is regarding the second floral oral. The next category that is a essential floral organs. And in this chapter, we are mainly focusing on the essential floral organs because essential floral organs are nothing but the floral parts which are directly involved in reproduction. And that includes andresium as well as gynesium. Andresium is the male sex part of the flower and the gynesium is the female sex part of the flower. So we will discuss about the andresium as well as gynesium in detail in this particular chapter. Now at the beginning let us study about the stamen. Stamen is nothing but the units of andresium. Andresium is the male sex part of the flower and if you compare the flower with the, the cone of gymnosperm in gymnosperms the male cones representing the andresium of angiosperms you know the male cones are made up of male cone is also called as male stromylus in gymnosperm that is made up of microsporophylls and in case of uh, angiosperms andresium is uh, just like the male cone andresium is made up of stamens so the stamens represented by microsporophyll in gymnosperm. So stamen is a modified leaf and you know the stamen consists of different parts. So this is uh, the diagrammatic representation of stamen. The stamen consists of three important parts. The first one is called as a filament. What is filament? The stalk of this stamen is called as a filament. And the length of this filament varies Sometime in some flowers, this filament may be absent. If the stamen does not contain the filament, that stamen is called as sessile stamen. If the stamen is consisting or the stamen consists the filament, the length of the filament varies. That varies from species to species. Or within a flower, there may be variation in the length of filament of different stamens. So normally this uh, filament is uh, colorless or that is whitish in color. And the second most pa important part of the stamen that is anther. Anther is the apex part of the stamen which is uh, swollen. And uh, this anther in most of the flowers, the anther is dithicus. That means it consists two thicae, that is the uh, two walls. And... Uh, this dithicus anther is also known as or the another term used to represent the anther in most of the flower that is bilobed. Since the anther is made up of two lobes that is called as bilobed. Since it is made up of two TK, two compartments that is called as dithicus. And most commonly in most of the flower flowering plants or in the anthers of flowers that consist of four sporogenous tissues. Sporogenous tissue means the origin of spores. Spore producing cells are collectively known as sporogenous tissue. The diagram representing the presence of four sporogenous tissue. So particularly this the anther which is given in this particular diagram shows the presence of four sporogenous tissue in the four corners of two lobes or two theca. So that's why this is called as tetrasprangiate. So in most of the plants, in most of the flowers, the anther is tetrasprangiate, consists of four sporogenous tissue. During the maturation, these sporogenous tissue, the cells of these sporogenous tissue undergoes meiotic division. 
that leads to the formation of pollen grains. At that stage, there will be the formation of a chamber within the anther. Such chambers consisting pollen grains, the microsporid traits are called as pollen sacs. So within these pollen sacs, the pollen grains will be there. Now let us study about the structure of a microsporangium or the young anther. Microsporangium. Sporangium means spore producing sac like structure. Microsporangium means the structure that produces microspores. The microsporangium is also called as young anther. There is a difference between young anther and the matured anther. Young anther consists of sporogenous tissue. But the matured anther consists pollen grains or the microspore tetrates. That is the major difference between the young anther as well as matured anther. So here the diagram representing the young anther. Here you cannot see the presence of microspore tetrates or the pollen grains because they are formed at the end of the maturation. See the first diagram that represents the outline of uh, inner structure of the anther. And the anther is uh, externally or it is covered by four important types of layers. The layers of anther worm includes the first one that is called as epidermis. You know in the plant body the outermost protective layer is called as epidermis. Epidermis is present in the stem that is present in the leaves found in the fruits found in the leaves as well as all the aerial parts of the plant body. Even in the root, the outermost protective layer that is the epidermis and is specifically known as epiblema. So even the anther consists outermost protective layer that is called as epidermis and just remember it is made up of single layered cells. Epidermis is followed by the second layer of anther wall that is called as endothecium. Just remember this endothecium is composed of, this endothecium is composed of hygroscopic cells and these hygroscopic cells have the capacity to intake maximum amount of water and that leads to the rupturing of uh, endothecium cells after the maturation of the anther and the rupturing of this endothecium results in the dehiscence of anther remember endothecium is responsible for dehiscence of anther endothecium is uh, followed by the middle layers Middle layers are generally made up of two to three layers of cells, compactly arranged cells. Of course, they will provide the protection. Epidermis provides protection. Endothecium mainly helps in the dehiscence of anther, and the middle layer provides protection. Next, the innermost layer of the anther wall, the very important layer that is called as tapetum. So, tapetum is the innermost layer of the anther wall, and it is especially nutritive in function. So we will discuss about the tapetum later. Before that, within the tapetum, there is a group of spore producing cells, sporogenous tissue. The group of pollen mother cells is called as sporogenous tissue. As I told earlier, the anther consists of four sporogenous tissue. That's why the anther is called as tetrasporangia. Now, some additional points regarding the tapetum. It is the innermost layer of the anther wall and the cells are relatively larger in size and they consist of dense cytoplasm and the multinucleate structure. Just remember the tapetal cells consist of more than one number of nuclei. So that is multinucleated. Tapetum is multinucleated, consists of dense cytoplasm. The cells are relatively larger in size and centripetally extended. That means the breadth or the size of the cells of tapetum is very unique. The shape of the cells of tapetum is very unique. The inner region is narrower and the outer peripheral region is broader in size. So this kind of arrangement is called as centripetally extended. They have dense cytoplasm, the prominent nuclei, multinucleated condition and that provides nourishment to the developing microspores. So this is a very important feature of tapetum cells, the cells of the tapetum. The cells of the tapetum consist of reserve food and this nutrition is provided, these nutrients are provided to the developing pollen grains at the time of 
microsporogenesis. The next very important feature of tapetum cells, the cells of the tapetum, they secretes an enzyme called as calase. They also secretes uh, the sporopollenin coated Jewish bodies as well as the pollen kit. Then what is the importance of these calase enzymes? Calase enzymes are responsible for the separation of microspore tetrates. And the Jewish bodies are small acellular structures that help in the development of pollen grains and the pollen kit. So it is a sticky layer on the enzyme made up of carotenoids and lipids. Just remember, they provide protection from UV rays. Okay, now let us study about the microsporogenesis. So what is mean by microsporogenesis? The process of formation of a microspores within the microsporangium by the meiotic division is known as microsporogenesis. So this occurs within the anther. This process occurs within the anther. So it is the procedure of development of microspores from the dust mother cells through the process of meiotic cell division. Dust mother cells are nothing but uh, pollen mother cells. The group of pollen mother cells is known as a sporogenous tissue and the meiotic cell uh, division that occurs in the pollen mother cells leads to the production of microspores or the pollen grains. The microspores formed are group of four cells called as microspore quadruplicate. So during the sporic meiosis that is during the microsporogenesis a group of four microspores is formed. So that group of four microspores is called as microspore quadruplicate. As there is a further development in the anther, as there is the further development in the anther, the moisture from the anther also dries out and uh, finally there will be the dehiscence of anther so that the microspore uh, quadruplicate or they are also called as microspore tetrates, so they will come out. The microspores separate and form into dust grains. So the dust grains are nothing but the pollen grains. Pollen grains are also called as dust grains. Now, let us see some additional points related to the pollen grains. There are different types of arrangement of microspore tetrates. Or in tetrates, there are, there are different types of arrangement of microspores. The first one is called as tetrahedral. The next one is a tetragonal or isobilateral. The third one is decussate followed by linear. And the fifth one is T-shaped. So other than these, two more terms are used. One is called as rhomboidal tetrad as well as the last one is crypto tetrad or pseudo monad. So these are the, the different types of arrangement of microspore tetrads. Now let us see one by one. So before that, just observe those diagrams. The first one that represent the tetrahedral, just to see the arrangement of microspores there, followed by the isobilateral, all the four microspores are clearly visible in this diagram. In the first diagram, only three are visible, one is present at the back side in another angle. And in the third one, that is the decussate type of arrangement, you can see three microspores here and one more is present. And in the last one, uh, the fourth one, that is uh, the T-shape, just to see the arrangement of microspores are there. And the last one is a linear. And in case of linear, all the microspores are arranged in a straight line. So these are the actually the five very important types. The rhomboidal tetrad is the name given to another type of uh, uh, arrangement of microspores. So that will be discussed later. So let us see one by one. The first one is tetrahedral. Tetra means four. So here, the pollen grains are arranged in two different planes. Four pollen grains are there. The four pollen grains are the microspores. Actually, they are called as microspores. Later, they will develop as pollen grains. So, pollen grains are the microspores are arranged in two different planes. And three grains are in one plane and one lies centrally over the other three. Just now, we, say, uh, we observe the diagram of this particular type. And in some cases, the pollen grains are released from the anther in tetrad condition itself. So in some cases, what happens at the time of uh, pollen, sorry, uh, anther dehiscence, the tetrads will be released as such. So these type of tetrads are called as obligate or permanent tetrads. Normally what happens after the dehiscence of anther, 
the microspore tetrads will be released out and on drying they will get separated the tetrads will get separated all, that means all the uh, four pollen grains they will not remain in a cluster they will get separated and each cell will separate from the group so but in some cases what happens they are released in the tetrad form itself so they are called as obligate or permanent tetrads common example drymis that is a member of winteraceae and the drosera the belo it belongs to the family drosiraceae as well as rhododendron belongs to ericaceae so this is regarding the tetrahedral type of arrangement of microspore tetrads the second one isobilateral or tetragonal tetragonal so in this case the isobilateral tetrads are also called as tetragonal tetrad or here the four pollen grains are in one plane four pollen grains are in one plane we can see all the four pollen grains from single plane itself so and they are equally spaced apart they are equally spaced apart so there is a equal distance or the gap between them so all the four pollen grains are arranged in one plane example typha latifolia belongs to the typhaceae and uh, hydicaria uh, aborea this belongs to the family monimiaceae so these are the, the different uh, important features of isobilateral or tetragonal type of arrangement of pollen grains or the microspore tetrads the next one decusset that means uh, right angle decusset means right angle so here pair wise the pollen grains are at right angle to each other and example for uh, this type of uh, pollen grain arrangement that is magnolia grandiflora that belongs to the family magnoliaceae as well as a triplex so these are the two examples for uh, the decusset the next one is t shaped so in case of t shaped type of arrangement the first division of pollen mother cell is transverse the first division is transverse to form a dyad so two cells are formed two microspores are formed and then the upper or lower of the dyad among the two microspores one upper or lower cell of dyad undergoes vertical or longitudinal division instead of transverse and that is yielding either straight or inverted t shaped configuration so that is called as t shaped arrangement of microspore tetrads an example is aristolochia species as well as and this belongs to the family aristolochiaceae and the polyanthus species belongs to amaryllidaceae so this is regarding the very important types of arrangement of microspore tetrads the next the fifth one is linear so very simple one the linear in this case the first division of pollen mother cell is transverse and dyad is formed again both the cells each cell of the dyad again divides transversely and it forms a linear tetrad and example is mimosa pudica this is nothing but the touch me not plant it produces linear tetrad or the pollen grains the microspore tetrads produced by them are linear type and the next one is rhomboidal tetrad it is uh, exactly similar to the isobilateral one that's why it is not uh, mentioned separately in the diagram so all the pollen grains are arranged in uh, one plane forming rhomboidal shape so example is uh, anona muricata the uh, different term is given and it belongs to the family anonaceae anona muricata and the next one is uh, crypto tetrad it is also called as pseudomonas and here uh, the pollen tetrad itself the entire the pollen tetrad uh, shows a unique shape you can see that in the photograph so here tetrads are formed without partition walls between the four compartments so there is no uh, differentiation of uh, pollen tetrads we cannot see the four pollen tetrads separately here so since there is no presence of partition walls and one out of the four nuclei develops normally and the rest three obliterate so that is very important feature here actually the four pollen tetrads are there among the four only one will be functional and the remain will obliterate so thus an apparent uh, monad but homologous to the tetrad is formed so structurally it is similar to the tetrad but actually functionally one one is the functional so it acts like a monad so these are the the different types of arrangement of pollen tetrads in different plants now let us study about uh, the next important uh, one example is given that is the member of cypressi produces a crypto tetrad or pseudomonad type of uh, pollen tetrads 
the next uh, another very important type of uh, pollen grain formation that is dyads most commonly in most of the plants uh, tetrads are formed four pollen grains will be there in a group but in some plants what happens dyads are produced dyads the name itself indicates group of two microspores so pollen grains which are united in pairs and shed from the anthers as the doubles are called as dyads and the dyads present in the sugeria palustris and uh, other members of podestemonaceae so these are the plants which shows uh, the production of uh, dyads and the dyads are formed due to the incomplete breakup of individual grain or monad so due to the failure of uh, the separation or the division of microspore tetrads it lay uh, the pollen grain from the group it leads to the formation of uh, dyads the next one is polyads poly means many so here what happens in most of the mimosae members each of the tetrad cells divides once or twice or more so that is yielding a group of 8 to 16 cells which remain together after the maturity so these compound grains are usually held together in small units and are called as polyads the next one example for polyads the plant that producing the polyads acacia auriculiformis as well as adenanthera pavonina and caliandra hematocephala and samania saman and albizia lebec so these are the plants that produces polyads the next one pollinia this is a very unique type of pollen grain produced by some plants particularly some plants so in orchidaceae orchid members and asclepidiaceae asclepidiaceae that is the name of the aeospermic plant family the whole contents of the anther and anther locule which shed as one united mass of pollen are called as pollinia so the entire anther or the anther locule which shed as one united mass of pollen are called as pollinia the example uh, is given here before that the pollinium that is a singular plural pollinia apparatus or the pollinium apparatus is a functional unit of corpusculum with its two attached arms called as translator and uh, pollinia and the example calotropis ecca so calotropis is a species dimia species etc of the asclepidias they belongs to the family asclepidiaceae and majority of the family orchidaceae shows this kind of uh, pollinia production now let us move to the very important topic related to the union or uh, the attachment of uh, stamens to the other parts of the flower addition of stamen addition means attachment in that first one epicephalus so what is mean by epicephalus so in this case the filaments are fused with the sepals or the filaments of the stamens are attached to the sepals sepal is the outermost floral oral of the flower and is followed by the petals or the corolla and then andrician and finally the innermost uh, floral oral that is the gynecium sometime there may not be the presence of uh, petals so any one of the non essential floral part may be there so such kind of flowers are there incomplete flowers so in this case what happens the filament of the stamen is uh, fused or attached to the sepals so that flower is the such type of uh, stamens are called as epicephalous stamens and example is verbena a verbena is a example so this is the verbena flower in which uh, the stamen or the filament of the stamen is attached to the sepal that is not clearly visible here but just remember the photograph of this particular plant the next one is epipetalous the name itself indicates the stamens or the filaments of the stamens attached to the petals it is a quite natural type of uh, uh, attachment or the addition so epipetalous in which the filaments fused with the petals and the most common example is uh, brinjal as well as datura so here the photograph of datura is given say this is a datura flower and if you take the longitudinal section of this flower or the petal you can see the arrangement of stamens very clearly to or attachment of filament very clearly to the uh, petals so this is uh, the epipetalous condition the next one is epiphyllus what about epiphyllus phyll means leaf actually but here epiphyllus means filament is attached to the tepal what is mean by tepal tepal is a unit of perianth so in case of monocot flowers we cannot differentiate the calyx and corolla they are alike 
they are similar in their appearance similar in their color so in case of monocot flowers we cannot differentiate them as sepals or petals so the calyx and corolla instead of that we are using the term perianth and the perianth is the group of tepals if the filaments of the stamens are attached to the tepals the condition is called as epiphyllous and commonly found in the monocot families such as liliaceae asparagus asparagus racemosus shatavari is the example for this you can see the flower of uh, epiphyllus so uh, here these are the monocot flowers the stamens so the filaments of the stamens are directly attached to the perianth or the tepals the next one is gynanthus so uh, what about the gynanthus it is again very unique type here anthers united with the stigma see anthers are the part of the androecium or the stamens stigma is a part of the gynecia so in this case anthers are united with the stigma so it leads to the formation of a special structure a union that is called as gynostegium gyno that represent gynecium part of the female reproductive part so there is a female reproductive part and here androecium that is a stamen particularly anther is attached to the stigma so that leads to the formation of gynostegium and the condition is called as gynanthus and most commonly produced by the plants such as calotropis so this is a photograph of calotropis flower right now let us move to the next one union of stamens so what about this union of stamens the previous one is the addition of stamens now union that means the fusion of stamens itself or the parts of the stamens or the entire stem that depends so based on that we can again classify the union of stamens into different types let us see one by one first one is uh, uh, the adelphus type so adelphus means the filaments are fused but anthers are free so in this type of union what happens the filaments are fused but anthers are free so fused filaments forms a staminal tube all the filaments of the all the stamens are fused together to form a continuous tube like structure the tube like structure is called as staminal tube again the adelphus can be classified into three types adelphus can be classified into three types in that first one mono adelphus mono means single so very simple in this case what happens the filaments of all the stamens are fused in single bundle are fused in a single bundle mono means a single the filaments of all the stamens are fused to form a single bundle that leads to the formation of mono adelphus condition and uh, the filaments of all the stamens fused to form one bundle in hibiscus cotton as well as lady's finger so these are the uh, members of uh, malvae c family so cotton family commonly known as cotton family and uh, here the mono adelphus condition is there the photograph is not given here and the next one is uh, diadelphus so what about the diadelphus di means two so in case of diadelphus condition in case of diadelphus filaments of all the stamens are fused in two bundles that means some filaments are fused in one bundle and some may be fused in another bundle totally two bundles so it is commonly found in the members of pea bean as well as clito uh, clitoria so in these uh, plants the diadelphus condition is uh, found here is a photograph of uh, uh, the diadelphus condition he you can see this is the single one the single filament and all the other filaments you can see nine filaments that means nine stamens the filaments of nine stamens are fused so that apex they are free but at the base they are fused here they are fused so the fusion of nine filaments leads to the formation of single bundle and one is separate so totally two bundle so this is called as diadelphus condition and the third one is polyadelphus so what is mean by polyadelph poly means many the filaments of all the stamens are fused in many bundles so more than two bundles of filaments are found commonly found in the citrus as well as lemon the citrus lemon scientific name so here uh this is a photograph of a citrus flower here the anthers are filaments of all the anthers are fused in many bundles so this is called as polyadelphus condition the next one is a, a syngenesious type this is a separate one adelphus followed by the syngenesious 
In case of syngenaceous type, the anthers are fused, but filaments are free. So, in the previous case, filaments are fused, anthers are free. But here, anthers are fused and the filaments are free. This condition is called as syngenaceous. The example for this is a sunflower as well as tridex, very unique type of arrangement. Here you can see the anther of a sunflower. See here, this is the anther. So these are the anthers fused in single bundle. And here you can see the free filaments. So by the help of needle that is uh, separated, you can see one uh, filament separately. So many number of uh, filaments are free. And all the anthers are fused in a single bundle. So this is called as syngenaceous. And the last one is synandrous. Synandrous means both the anthers and filaments are fused. Both the anthers as well as filaments are fused. And it is commonly produced by the plants such as cucumber or the cucurbita. That is the scientific name, cucumis. So here, the both the anthers as well as the filaments are fused. You can see the photograph here. So here all the filaments are fused and here the uh, anthers are fused. So this is regarding the different types of union of stamens. The union of Okay, the next one is structure of male gametophyte or the pollen grain. So pollen grains actually representing the male gametophyte. So what are the structures or the structural components of pollen grain? So let us study one by one the important features. See this is a photograph of pollen grains. The first one is uh, the pollen grain, uh, uh, the structure, the sectional view of pollen grain is uh, uh, visible here. Uh, you can see the different wall layers and the inner content of that pollen grain. The next diagram that is a germinated pollen grain. Actually the germinated pollen grain represent the male gametophyte. Now let us see the features. So male gametophyte, nothing but the pollen grains and these pollen grains are also called as dust grains. Pollen grains are also called as dust grains and uh, the size of the pollen grain is around 25 to 50 micrometer in diameter so 25 to 50 micrometer in diameter this is the size of pollen grain and normally the pollen grains are uh, made up of two layered wall they are covered by the two layered wall the outer wall is called as exine and is chemically made up of sporopollenin so sporopollenin is uh, the hardest known organic compound no enzyme is uh, identified yet which is capable of digesting this particular uh, chemical compound. So sporopollenin is the hardest known organic compound. And the exine, outer exine consists of uh, small opening like structures. They are called as germ pores. I will tell you about the germ pores in detail later. And uh, uh, the pollen grains are well preserved as uh, fossils. That is mainly because of uh, the chemical component found in their exine that is called as sporopollenin. As I told earlier, that is highly rigid, highly resistant to temperature variation, pressure or the pH variation, etc. So, the exine exhibits a fascinating array of patterns and designs. If you observe the pollen grains under the microscope, we can see the great diversity in their texture. The exine shows a fascinating array of patterns and designs. And the inner wall layer of uh, pollen grain or the inner layer of uh, pollen grain wall that is called as intine and the intine is chemically made up of cellulose and pectin. Outer wall exine made up of uh, sporopollenin and inner wall is intine that is made up of cellulose and pectin. Now let us see some important points regarding the germ pores. As I told earlier germ pores are nothing but the small apertures openings which are present on the exine layer of the pollen grain where the sporopollenin is absent. So normally the pollen grain exine consists of sporopollenin but wherever there is a presence of opening or the germ pore in such region the sporopollenin is absent that is absent. Okay. The germ pore the germ pore helps in the formation of pollen tube and the release of male gametes during fertilization. At the time of pollen grain germination, the pollen tube will come out through these pores, through these germ pores. And there are usually three germ pores in the di uh, dicot pollen grains. The pollen grains of dicot plants consist three germ pores on the surface, that means in the exine, and that's why they are called as triculpate, and the one in monocots. The monocot pollen grains, monocot pollen grains consist of single germ pore in the exine 
and that is called as monoculpate. So this is regarding uh, the additional points on germ pores. The next one, structure of male gametophyte or pollen grain continues. So here, the cytoplasm, the inner content of the pollen grain is nothing but pollen grain is nothing but uh, cell microspores develop as pollen grain. So they consist of cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm is surrounded by the plasma membrane. The cytoplasm is surrounded by the plasma membrane. Okay. And then at the matured stage, at the matured stage, that means when the pollen grains, when the microspores are developed as pollen grain, on maturity, the pollen grains consist of two cells. Most of the cases, not always, in most of the plants, the matured pollen grain consists of two cells. One is called as vegetative cell and the another one is called as generative cell. The vegetative cell is bigger in size and has abundant food reserve and a large irregularly shaped nucleus. I repeat, the vegetative cell is larger in size that consists abundant reserve food as well as that consists large irregularly shaped nucleus. Then generative cell where it is located. So the generative cell is smaller in size and that floats that floats in the cytoplasm of vegetative cell. So cell within the cell. Generative cell present within the vegetative cell. So it, the generative cell floats in the cytoplasm of vegetative cell and that, can say, that is a spindle shape. The cell is a spindle shape with the dense cytoplasm and the nucleus. Say in over 60% of the angiosperms, that means out of 100, 60% of the plants, 60 plants, angiosperms, 60% of angiosperms produces two-celled stage pollen grains. That means in maximum number of angiosperms, the pollen grains are released in two-celled stage, which consists of vegetative cell as well as generative cell. And in the remaining species, remaining means 40% 40, uh, percent, 40 percent of the angiosperms. The generative cell divides mitotically. The generative cell divides mitotically. And the mitotic division of generative cell that leads to the production of two male gametes. And this occurs before the pollen grains are shed. That means before the releasing of pollen grains from the anther, the generative cell undergoes mitotic division. And that leads to the formation of two male gametes. So this is called as three-celled stage. Remember, in maximum number of uh, angiosperms, that is in 60% of the angiosperms, pollen grains are shed in two-celled stage. And in the remaining 40% of the angiospermic plants, the pollen grains are shed in two uh, three-celled stage. Now, the next one, positive as well as uh, negative aspects of pollen grains. So what are the benefits of pollen grains and what are the harms of pollen grains with respect to the human life with respect to the human life so severe allergies and bronchial afflictions like chronic respiratory disorders such as asthma bronchitis etc are developed because of the pollen grains of some plant species particularly the parthenium or the carrot grass pollen grain causes severe allergic reaction in some people in some people but at the same time, it has some positive benefits also. The pollen tablets, the tablets, the capsules prepared by the pollen grains of some plants are used as food supplements to increase the performance of athletes as well as race horses. As we all know, the pollen grains have the reserve food material. They are nutritive rich. So the tablets or the capsules prepared by the, those, the pollen grains of some fa plant families are used to uh, provide uh, the additional nutritive supplements to the human body as well as especially in case of athletes as well as race horses also. So this is regarding the positive as well as negative aspects of pollen grains. Now the viability of pollen grain. So viability of pollen grain is nothing but uh, viability means the living stage till what time they can retain their uh, life or this is the duration to which they can retain their capacity of fertilization. So that is called as viability. The viability of pollen grain is highly variable. It varies from species to species. It depends on the prevailing temperature as well as humidity. 
not only the internal factors even the external factors abiotic factors such as uh, the temperature and the humidity also decides that determines the viability of the pollen grain so in cereals such as rice and wheat the pollen grains will lose the viability within 30 minutes of their release once they release from the anther they can retain their viability only up to 30 minutes so within which they have to deposit on the stigma of uh, the compatible uh, stigma of the flower and that should involve in the fertilization otherwise such pollen grains becomes useless and in the members of uh, rosaceae leguminosae as well as in the solanaceae they can uh, retain their viability for month so up to a month they can the pollen grains of these plants can retain their viability and it is possible to store the pollen grains in liquid nitrogen under minus 196 degree celsius minus 196 degree celsius uh, just like the in the pollen banks just like the seed bank you know the seed bank in seed bank uh, the seedlings are preserved the seeds of uh, uh, good variety plants or crop plants are preserved in the same way it is possible to preserve the pollen grains of some plants pollen grains of the plants under uh, minus 196 degree celsius by using the liquid nitrogen the technology is called as cryo preservation so this is regarding the viability of pollen grains viability of pollen grains now let us move to study about the structure of a pistil so pistil is nothing but a female reproductive part of the flower see so the pistil is the female reproductive part and uh, it may be monocarpellary or multicarpellary monocarpellary means the pistil or the gynoecium made up of single carpel if it consists two carpels then it is called as bicarpellary three carpels tricarpellary four carpels tetracarpellary five pentacarpellary like this if the gynoecium or the pistil is made up of more number of carpels that condition is called as monocarpellary again one more uh, uh, classification is there that is based on their union if the carpels of the gynoecium or the pistil are fused with each other in a single bundle that is called as syncarpus if the carpels are fused that is called as syncarpus if the carpels are free in the gynoecium or in the pistil that is called as apocarpus generally the gynoecium or the pistil consists of three important parts three important parts the one is called a stigma followed by style and finally the ovary stigma is the uppermost part of the apex region of the gynoecium it is also called as the receptive site where the pollen grains are deposited at the time of pollination at the time of pollination and the style is nothing but a long tubular narrow passage through which the pollen tube passes at the time of pollen germination at the time of fertilization and the basal swollen part of the gynoecium or the pistil that is called as ovary and within the ovary there is a chamber the chamber which is present within the ovary is called as ovarian cavity or that is also called as ovarian hole and is most commonly known as locule again the number of locule varies and within the locule the ovules are uh, present but the ovules are attached to a sticky mass of tissue that is called as placenta so placenta is nothing but a sticky mass of tissue on which the ovules are attached to which ovules are attached so ovules are actually representing the megasporangia so what is mean by megasporangia megasporangia means the megaspore bearing or megaspore producing structure since the megaspores are produced within the ovules the ovules are known as megasporangia so megasporangia commonly called as ovules and the number of ovules varies the number of ovules varies it may be single the flower or the gynoecium may consist of single ovule so most commonly found in the plants such as wheat paddy mango in these plants single ovule is present within the ovary and it may be more than that so the number of ovules may be many more than one number of ovules may be there in the ovary of some plants such as papaya watermelon as well as in the orchids 
So in papaya, watermelon as well as orchids consists large number of seeds. The reason is the presence of large number of ovules within the ovary. Okay, now let us study about the ovules in detail. The structure of ovules in detail. So as I told earlier, ovule is nothing but integumented indehiscent megasporangium. Integumented indehiscent megasporangium. Integument means it is covered by it is covered by the protective layers. They are specifically known as integuments. Indehiscent. Indehiscent means they never open. They will not break. They will not. They will never open. So that is why it, these are called as indehiscent megasporangium. Since it produces megaspores, it is called as megasporangium. And the ovules are located within the ovarian cavity. These are located within the ovarian cavity or the locules. And uh, these ovules are attached to the placenta. I Just now I told about the placenta, the sticky mass of tissue to which the ovules are attached. So it is a structure that gave rise to and contains the female reproductive cells. Remember, the ovule consists, the ovule consists of uh, the female reproductive cells. Female reproductive cell means particularly the female gamete, female gamete. Before that, female gametophyte will be formed. So that is also produced or developed within the ovule itself. So ovule is just like the female reproductive part of the flower. So it is a part of the uh, gynecium that means gynecium in that ovary within the ovary locule within the locule ovules are present so within the ovules megaspores are formed later female gametophyte will be formed and then the female gamete is also produced within the ovule itself now let us see the structure of ovule the structure of ovule there are different uh, types of the structure of ovules uh, the first one See, this is uh, the diagram of anatropous ovule. This diagram is given in our textbook. You can see the labeling of uh, the different parts of the ovule. Chalazal pole, embryo sac, nucellus, inner integument, outer integument, micropylar pole, micropyle, funicle and hilum. Now, let me explain one by one. So, first one. The ovule is a small structure attached to the placenta by means of a stalk called funicle. The stalk of the ovule through which the body of the ovule is uh, connected to the placenta is called as funicle. The stalk of the ovule is called as funicle. And the point of attachment of funicle to the body of the ovule is called as hilum. The body of the ovule fuses with the funicle in the region called as hilum. So it is nothing but the point of attachment of funicle to the body of ovule. Thus, hilum represents the junction between the ovule and funicle. It is a junction between the ovule and the funicle. And each ovule has one or two protective envelopes called as integuments. The protective layers of ovules are called as integuments. So each ovule has one or two protective envelopes called as integuments. Sometimes in some species, single integument may be there. And in most of the cases, more than one. Generally, two integuments will be there. We can differentiate them as outer integument and inner integument. So these are the protective layers. The integuments encircle the nucellus except at the tip where a small opening called the micropyle is organized. In simple words, the unattachment of outer integuments leads to the formation of an opening called as micropyle. So integuments encircle the nucellus except at the tip where the small openings called as micropyle is organized. The next structural components opposite the micropylar end. If you consider micropylar end at one, end, one side, the op at the opposite side, the opposite the micropylar end is the chalaza. The opposite region is called as chalaza, representing the basal part of the ovule. So the basal part of the ovule is known as chalaza. And the enclosed within the integuments is a mass of cells called as nucellus. So the nucellus forms a major part, major component of the ovule. The major portion of the ovule is covered by the nucellus. This is a very important component of the ovule, the central most part of the ovule. So ovule consists nucellus 
and the new cells is made up of a group of diploid cells so enclosed within the integument is a mass of cells normally those cells are diploid in nature they consist two set of chromosomes so there is a mass of cells called as new cells cells of the new cells have abundant food reserves the reserve food material rich amount of reserve food material is stored in the cells of new cells and this new cells the located in the new cells is a embryo sac or the female gametophyte but normally this is formed at the time of maturation when the ovule matures slowly there is a occurrence of process called as megasporogenesis and uh, later there is a development of female gametophyte called as embryo sac so here the embryo sac is just uh, mentioned but the clear structure of the embryo sac is not shown here so normally the young ovule does not contain the embryo sac when it matures within the ovule the embryo sac is formed and the embryo sac represent the female gametophyte an ovule generally has a single embryo sac formed from a megaspore you know the megaspore are haploid the megaspores are produced by the meiotic division megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis leads to the formation of four megaspores but here they say is that an ovule generally has a single embryo sac so within the ovule only one embryo sac is formed and the origin of um, one embryo sac is only one megaspore that means out of four megaspores only one megaspore develops as a female gametophyte so now let us see the different types of uh, ovules different types of ovules based on the number of integuments as i mentioned earlier the number of integuments may be one or two sometime it varies so let us see the different types of ovules based on the number of integuments the first one is unitegmic uni means single so one integument is found in the ovule so normally in the members of higher dicots like compositae gymnosperms gymnosperm is a separate group the separate division so even gymnosperms also produce a seed so of course they should contain the ovules they consist naked ovules that's why they produce as naked seeds so the in gymnosperms as well as in the members of compositae unitegmic ovules are formed they consist single integument the next one is bitegmic bi means two two integuments the ovules consist two integuments most commonly the monocot seeds or the monocot ovules consist of two integuments not the seeds integuments uh, ovules and the primitive dicots like cruciferae as well as malvaceae malvaceae also produces ovules with two integuments bitegmic the next one is tritegmic what is mean by tritegmic it is also called as polytegmic more than two tritegmic or polytegmic three or more if it consists exactly three then it is called as tritegmic if it consists more than that then uh, the ovule is called as polytegmic and most commonly this type of ovules are produced by the plants such as uh, asphodelus asphodelus is a plant that produces uh, uh, tritegmic polytegmic ovules the next one is ategmic so what is mean by ategmic ategmic means no integuments if the ovule does not contain additional protective layers if there is no integument such uh, ovules are called as ategmic most commonly produced by the sandalwood santalum as well as loranthus liriosoma and uh, olax so these are the, the different plants that produces uh, ategmic ovules now the next one is the special integuments in some plants in some ovules some special integuments are developed special integuments are nothing but the derivations or the additional structures formed in the ovules let us see one by one in that first one is aerial type of integuments so special type of integuments in that first one aerial type of integuments so what are these aerial type of integuments So it is the third integument which develops from the funicle at the base of the ovule. So this is the third integument which develops from funicle only at the base of the ovule. And example is lychee. The next one is caruncle or strophiole type of integuments. So caruncle type or the strophiole type of integuments means it is formed due to the outgrowth of outer integument over the micropyle. outgrowth it is outgrowth of outer integument 
over the micropyne and commonly produced by the resinous communis uh, plant castor seeds produces this type of additional integuments called as carankel type or the stropheol type the next one is the comma type of uh, integuments comma type of integuments so in some of the plants unicellular filaments unicellular so note that unicellular filaments like structures are present on the seed which is formed by the cells of outer surface of outer integument and most commonly produced by the plants such as calotropis as well as gossypium so these are the some of the very important uh, special type of integuments now let us study about the nucellus some additional points regarding the nucellus as i told earlier the very important part of the uh, ovule is nucellus the very important part of the ovule is nucellus the major portion of the ovule is covered by this nucellus not nucleus nucellus so it is mainly composed of parenchyma test tissue if it is a parenchyma we can imagine or we can guess the function of this particular cell storage so parenchyma test tissue is found in the nucellus and all the cells are diploid cells they consist two set of chromosomes mainly involved in the storage of food and again the nucellus can be divided into different types the first one is called as uh, tenonucleate type of nucellus so what is this tenonucleate type of nucellus here nucellus is thin or less very small amount of nucellus will be there thin nucellus will be there that is called as tenonucleate the second uh, example for this is the compositae members the second type of nucellus that is called as crassinucleate so crassurinaceae is an example for this that's why it is named as crassinucleate in case of crassinucleate the nucellus is massive or more rich amount of reserve food the rich amount of well, the more number of uh, nucellus cells will be there so that is called as crassinucleate type of nucellus now let us see the types of ovules the very important topic uh, but in our textbook only one type of uh, ovule is mentioned that is anatropous ovule but actually there are different types of ovules let us see the different types of ovules one by one the first one is orthotropous see the diagram uh, represent the orthotropous type of ovule ortho means here straight so it is also called as a straight ovule you can see the funicle cellaza uh, nucellus embryo sac integuments just observe the funicle then uh, embryo sac and the micropyle the funicle embryo sac and micropyle they even the chalaza they are arranged in a straight line they are arranged in a straight line so it is also called as erect ovule orthotropous ovule is also called as erect ovule or it is also called as atropous ovule this is another name atropous ovule here the body of ovule is straight and upright over funicle and the hilum chalaza micropyle occur on the same line same line the example is piperaceae the members of piperaceae produces this type of ovules even utricaceae the cycas that is a member of gymnospermae and the members of polygonaceae also produces straight ovule that is another term it is not given here just remember straight ovule or erect ovule or atropous ovule or orthotropous ovule one and the same so this is the first type of ovule uh, based on the shape based on the structure just observe it and remember it the next type of ovule is called as anatropous ovule so the diagram which is given in our textbook is actually the anatropous ovule so this is the diagram of anatropous ovule in our textbook it is uh, given in opposite direction no problem one and the same just observe the position of uh, funicle and then micropyle embryo sac and chalaza see micropyle embryo sac and chalaza are arranged in one line they are arranged in one line and uh, the next uh, funicle is found in another line if it is a micropyle embryo sac chalaza if it is a micropyle chalaza and this is a funicle so like this separately so side by side arrangement so in case of anatropous ovule uh, it is also called as recipinate type of ovule this is another name in this case the ovules become completely inverted during the development so that the micropyle lies close to the hilum so just see the position of a micropyle so here is a micropyle 
and uh, very near to it there is a point of attachment of funicle to the body of the ovule called as a hilum so in this case the ovules become completely inverted during uh, the development so that the micropyle lies close to the hilum next the hilum is a scar that marks the point where the seed was attached to the fruit wall by the funicle so after the, even after the development of seed we can see the location or the position of that hilum so the fused funiculus forms a ridge called raphe so the extension of funicle that is called as raphe that is a clearly visible in anatropus type of ovule and it is the most common in about 82% of the angiosperm i told um, maximum number of plant produces anatropus type of ovules around 82% of the angiosperm produces anatropus type of ovule example is helianthus sunflower as well as tridax produces uh, the anatropus type of ovule now let us move to the next type of ovule that is a hemi anatropus type of ovule so what is mean by hemi anatropus ovule hemi anatropus so this is uh, the diagram of hemi anatropus ovule anatropus is the previous one this is hemi anatropus so hemi tropus is uh, another term hemi anatropus is also called as hemi tropus here the body of these ovules becomes at right angle they are arranged at right angle in relation to the funicle if it is a funicle if it is a funicle the remaining body parts are arranged like this so this type of arrangement this type of arrangement is noticed in hemi anatropus ovule the body of these ovules the body of these ovules um, becomes at a right angle in relation to the funicle so it looks like ovule is lying on its side then intermediate between orthotropus and anatropus so this type of ovule is the intermediate between orthotropus and anatropus anatropus is completely inverted orthotropus is straight so the intermediate stage is called as hemi anatropus that's why the term hemi is used here not completely hemi half so hemi anatropus type and this is commonly produced by the members of ranunculaceae as well as some cruciferae so this is regarding hemi anatropus or hemitropus ovule the next type of ovule is called as campylotropus ovule see the campylotropus ovule this is a photograph of campylotropus ovule here the body of this type is bent and the alignment between chalaza and micropyle is lost so till here the micropyle embryo sac chalaza they are found almost in the straight line but here what happens the body of this type is bent and alignment between chalaza and micropyle is lost so they are not found in the straight line and the embryo sac is only slightly curved not completely uh, the embryo sac is slightly curved sometime it may be straight also the that may not be the uh, curvature of uh, embryo sac it may be straight also but in some cases it is only slightly curved not completely curved so that is very important point okay and hilum chalaza and micropyle come nearby hilum chalaza micropyle actually chalaza and micropyle they are found in that opposite ends but here what happens hilum chalaza micropyle they come nearby example cypsella some legumes chinopodium so these are the example where the campylotropus ovules are found the next type of ovule is called as amphitropus ovule so what about amphitropus ovule in case of amphitropus ovule say this is a photograph of amphitropus ovule the very important point is with respect to the embryo sac the body of the ovule is very much curved and that the embryo sac and the ovule itself take the shape of horse shoe so here the shape of the ovule is a horse shoe shape and uh, it is commonly produced by the plants such as buttermoss and uh, some crucifers so here you can see the diagram of embryo sac the embryo sac is curved the embryo sac is curved the next type of ovule is a sarsinotropus ovule sarsinotropus ovule so what about uh, sarsinotropus ovule very unique type uh see the complexity in the arrangement of ovule here and the funicle in this case is especially long that is creates that it creates a nearly full circle around the ovule whose micropyle is ultimately pointing upwards 
so the funicle is very larger in size elongated and uh, the funicle in this case is especially long that uh, creates a nearly full circle around the ovule so completely curved uh, in the form of a circle so it is most commonly produced by the plants such as opuntia so these are the the different types of ovules the types of ovules the next topic is uh, megasporogenesis megasporogenesis so what is mean by megasporogenesis here you can see the diagrammatic representation of megasporogenesis just remember all these events takes place within the ovule within the ovule means particularly within the nucellus nucellus is made up of uh, the diploid cells and uh, such nucellus cells consist reserve food material but at the time of megasporogenesis one of the nucellus cell present towards the micropylar end acts as a megaspore mother cell so now let us see the important uh, uh, points related to the megasporogenesis the process of formation of megaspores from megaspore mother cell by meiotic cell division is called as megasporogenesis a single megaspore mother cell mmc single megaspore mother cell in the micropylar region produces four megaspores four megaspores a large cell containing a dense cytoplasm and a prominent nucleus in the nucellus near the micropylar end acts as a megaspore mother cell so megaspore mother cell undergoes meiotic division meiotic division that is a sporic meiosis and finally leads the production of four megaspores so the four megaspores are uh, observed in the diagram just observe the diagram here see in the previous case uh, here only one megaspore is found only one megaspore one of the nucellus cell present towards the micropylar end acts as a megaspore mother cell so that undergoes uh, first meiosis leads the formation of two cells so two cells are formed and then both the cells both the cells again undergoes uh, Uh, the second step of meiosis meiosis 2 and that leads to the formation of four megaspores now out of these four megaspores out of these four megaspores only one megaspore will continue the process of further development and the remaining three megaspores will degenerate the remaining three megaspores will degenerate now let us study the uh, formation of female gametophyte female gametophyte is nothing but embryo sac so let us see the steps involved in the uh, embryo sac development so normally in case of angiosperm the development of embryo sac is specifically known as monosporic development what is mean by monosporic mono means single as i told earlier out of four megaspores produced from one megaspore mother cell only one megaspore mother cell will be there only one of the nucellus cell present towards a micropylar end acts as a megaspore mother cell so only four megaspores are formed but out of four megaspores only one will continue its uh, for the developmental processes and the remaining three will degenerate so one megaspore develops into one female gametophyte so this type of development is called as monosporic development and three sequential mitotic free nuclear division in the megaspore leads to the development of female gametophyte that is called as embryo sac i repeat say megaspore is a haploid that consists of haploid nucleus now within this megaspore what happens three sequential mitotic free nuclear division only the nuclear division takes place no cytoplasmic division within the megaspore and that leads to the formation of eight nucleated structure that leads to the formation of eight nucleate stage and at the time of maturation the matured embryo sac matured embryo sac consists of seven cells and eight nuclei so that's why the matured embryo sac is called as seven celled eight nucleated structure see the first one before this before this there will be the presence of megaspore Uh, within a megaspore one haploid nuclei nucleus is there that undergoes mitotic division first mitosis so those two nuclei they will move towards the respective polar region again both the haploid nuclei undergoes one more uh, 
mitosis, one more mitosis, second mitosis. Then all the four haploid nuclei, all the four haploid nuclei undergoes one more mitosis leads to the formation of total eight haploid nuclei. Now, among these eight haploid nuclei, one nucleus from each polar region, one nucleus from each polar region move towards to the center, move towards the center. And then they are called as polar nuclei. They are called as polar nuclei. You can see in the diagram two polar nuclei and three cells, three cells, three nuclei present at the chalazal end. They will develop the cellular structure around it. They will develop as a cells. Those three cells at the chalazal end, at the chalazal end, uh, they will develop as antipodas. And the three more cells, haploid cells, present towards the micropylar end. So in the diagram, micropylar end is given to at the upper region and the lower region represents the chalazal end here in this particular diagram. So three haploid cells present towards the micropylar end are called, are together known as egg apparatus. Among these, one is very larger in size, that is particularly the egg cell and the remaining two are small size cells and they are called as synergids. And the synergids are characterized by the presence of a special structure called as the filiform apparatus. So this is regarding uh, the development of a female gametophyte that is a embryo sac. Now let us see the structure of female gametophyte or the embryo sac. What are the structural components of embryo sac? The matured embryo sac. See here the photograph. This is the diagram of a matured embryo sac. Here this is a chalazal end and this is a micropylar end. This is a micropylar end. At the micropylar end, as I told earlier, uh, one large size cell that is called as egg and two small size cells are called as synergies. So when compared to, when compared to the synergies, the egg cell is larger in size and the three haploid cells present towards the three haploid cells present towards the chalazal end are called as antipodals. They are called as antipodals. And at the center, you can see two haploid nuclei. They are called as polar nuclei. At the time of maturation, at the time of fertilization, they will fuse together. They will fuse together and that leads to the formation of a secondary nucleus. Secondary nucleus. So till here, uh, the pre-fertilization events and the structure. So next, we will discuss about the fertilization event followed by the post-fertilization event. So that will be discussed in the next uh, session. So now let us move to uh, the MCQs on these particular topics.